Ahmad Masri is an amyloid cardiologist at The Ohio State University, a team that will, oh, is it Oregon? Ah, my bad. And he's going to be talking about the upcoming treatments for ATTR. It's a shame I had such a good thing for Ohio State. Anyway, sorry. I, I spent four years in Ohio, so that's okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so some of this you've already heard about. Um, it's looking into the future, what are we looking at right now, including things that already have been studied. This is focusing on TTR, these are my disclosures. So you've seen this or some element of it before, which is how do we currently address TTR there are opportunities in the future to address more, but currently we either shut down the production from the factory, which is the liver, by different degrees of shutting that production down, and we call those silencers. That includes drugs that temporarily decrease the production, or drugs that we think in the future might permanently decrease the production, and that's what um, the gene silencer Intelia has uh, called NTLA2001 uh, going into phase three trials soon. We'll talk about that. Then you have the stabilizers that you heard about, which is instead of not producing TTR or decreasing that production, why not just you know chase the protein around and don't allow it to go to the organ uh, anymore? And then finally, you know, which which has been the holy grail all along, can we actually remove? what's been deposited into the organs. A lot of these other drugs don't necessarily remove actively what's deposited into the, the organs. Neither would the ones we will be using, but we'll talk about how they would work more. So uh, starting with stabilizers, you all know Tefamidus, Vindamax. There is a new stabilizer, Acromidus. Some of you might have participated in these clinical trials. Uh, the sponsor is Bridge Bio, and this was the Attribute CM trial that just reported two months ago and uh, showed that the uh, uh, drug met its uh, pre-specified endpoint. So the way that it works, while it's a stabilizer, it's slightly different from Tefamidus. So Tefamidus binds into a different pocket on the TTR. So the TTR protein circulates as a tetramer, so four parts. So the goal is to not to prevent, so the goal is to, to, to prevent it from falling apart. And so Tefamidus does it slightly differently from Acromidus. Acromidus uses something that was discovered in Portugal, which is naturally occurring mutation. That mutation at the gene level makes the uh, TTR tetramer super stabilized. So that's something that happens in nature. So that's what this exploits. And as you can see from the cartoon here, is that the AG10 or Acromidus, that's his, other, uh, his older name, makes those parts of the protein bind together and stay bound until essentially it's uh, uh, thrown out in a way. And so these are the results of the trial that are positive and we expect to, uh, to, for this drug to be submitted to the FDA and other regulatory agencies for review. This was the all-cause mortality. The good news is that you know, there's still reduction in all-cause mortality, even though it doesn't hit um, statistical significance on its own, but the relative risk reduction is still 25%, which is fairly close to what Tefamidus has shown from a relative risk perspective. Now, um, the other point is we are finding the disease earlier. So people are doing better overall, even if they're given placebo, which means that we are finding the disease earlier. This is the other part of the story for this trial, which is heart failure or cardiovascular hospitalizations. The drug was uh, associated with 50% reduction in that, which is something that is really good to see because you know, that's part of what we want to do. We don't want to see patients go to the hospital. Every time a patient goes to the hospital, there is a downstream effect of being in the hospital, including, you know, deconditioning, loss of muscle mass, you know, or, or, or seeing doctors and nurses, maybe something that one doesn't want to do all the time. So a brief, brief mention of what's the future for uh, TTR, polyneuropathy. So th there are four agents, two of them, or three of them already are approved. 
And so inotorsin, petisiran, vitrusiran already available commercially in the United States. So we can black that out. The one that is currently under FDA review is eplontorsin. And, you know, I think there are some small differences amongst the four, but the bottom line is the same. There's going to be a discussion between you and the treating physician, and you can think about about how you want to approach this. But this drug is not available yet, Eplontorsin, which is the second generation from Inotorsin, um, and has not been so far associated with the same issues that Inotorsin had. Um, Apollo B is a, the, a trial that looked at Petisiran, which is a silencer for patients with heart disease, so not nerve disease. The inclusion was heart disease. The trial uh, was designed for a one-year trial, looked at six-minute walk test, and recently the FDA decided that they will not approve Petisiran based on this trial. They, everybody believes that the drug actually functions well and works well and whatnot, but the FDA wants other trials to prove that. Which is, you know, we're going to be looking at this maybe next year. This is a drug called Vitrusiran. It's, again, commercially available for polyneuropathy. The liver takes it up. And when it takes it up, it goes to the liver cells called hepatocytes, and it decreases the production of transthyretin. The other name that you might see on the chart is prealbumin. So if that, decrease, that gets decreased by about 80% or so in vitrusiran. So there is, it's approved for neuropathy, but if you have heart disease, even if it's hereditary or variant heart disease, you actually cannot get vitrusiran. And so right now, there is the study ongoing, hopefully we'll hear about it next year, about the, the results from it, looking at um, longer follow-up and more endpoints that the regulatory agencies are used to, such as death and uh, cardiovascular hospitalizations, six-minute walk test, and other, other, other endpoints there. So uh, we've already talked about eplontorsin. It's another drug that, through a different mechanism, but the same, you know, goal in the end of the day gets again taken up to the hepatocytes or the liver cells and shuts down the production of the transthyretin protein by also about 80% or so. And so this is the, the biggest trial in the history of amyloid, probably in the history of rare disease actually. It's cardiotransform. It enrolled 1,400 patients. 1,468 I think might have been the final number and randomized them to placebo versus eplontorsin, a uh, global trial, and anyone could have been on Vindamax or Tefamilis to entering the trial. Um, we have had, you know, many probably patients here are participating in this study. So uh, probably we'll hear about this in 2025 or 2026. And so now uh, shifting gears to gene uh, silencing using gene editing. So not to spend too much time on the details, but the concept is actually somewhat similar. Why this is a perfect disease to do this in? Because we can deliver gene editing product to the liver. So by being able to deliver it to the organ that you want to target, that's the, that's the first step. And so these lipid nanoparticles, they already exist out there. Like if you take petisiran, those already are there. So we can deliver this product to the liver, and then it goes into the liver, integrates into the genome or into the gene machinery that you have, and supposed to permanently make the production of TTR defective. And so your body, when it sees that the TTR sequence is not what it's supposed to be, it throws it away. It doesn't produce it. And so that's the whole concept. You already have that, by the way, which is vitrusiran, Eplontors and all the others we talked about, correct? But the difference here is the degree of silencing, which I'll show you, and the second difference is the durability or how long it goes. It's supposed to be one and done. So that's essentially the, the, the point here. This is from the phase one trial, and you know it showed that patients achieved 90% or more TTR reduction by one month of, of giving the infusion there. And so there are questions here. Is 90% better than 80%? We actually don't know. Are there any downsides to doing this? We actually don't know. And so that's why we want to learn all of these things. And there's going to be a phase three trial, large phase three trial happening probably early next year, end of this year, early next year. And so I just wanted to reiterate to you that we already shut down the production of TTR by about 80% with the drugs that we already have. Now. Um, 
Are we good on time? I think we are. A uh, couple of more minutes. So uh, then came the concept of, okay, we can prevent more TTR from going to organs in general on average. Can we remove TTR from organs? And we didn't have a, you know, a way of doing that before. We had some hypothesis, some basic science stuff here and there. And you know, we were going to start trials not knowing if it actually works or not until a couple of reports came out that's, that are helping us as, as well as will help you make a decision if you want to be a part of these trials. One of them is uh, from the National Amyloid Center in the UK where they had three patients that spontaneously you know, resolved their disease. So their disease regressed on its own. How did that happen? We don't know. But the bottom line is their body was able to develop an antibody against transthyretin. And so they removed it from the heart, essentially. And they had very nice images and everything showing that this actually happened. Now, whether those are natural antibodies against TTR or they're being confused with something else that interacts with TTR, we don't know. But this only happened in three patients out of many, many they have. And so this is not a common thing. This is a very, very rare thing to observe. But it reassures us that our hearts are able to actually, you know, maybe go back to a stage before what they look like now. And so talking about the drugs that are currently being tested, so Prothena Novo Nordisk now has this drug um, uh, that once the TTR tetramer falls apart, it becomes a monomer, then breaks down more. Once it becomes a fibril and wants to deposit in the tissues, it actually exposes something on its surface that typically is not available. And so you can target that by giving a monoclonal antibody. So antibody, like we do in a lot of other diseases where we use antibodies to treat these diseases, same concept here. You're trying to tag those fibrils in the heart, in the myocardium, trying to tag them so that the body can help remove them for you, but just accelerate the process. If someone develops TTR at the age of 40, for example, or let's take an example of something we actually observe. In another amyloid disease, light chain amyloidosis, if someone develops that at a young age, typically they, over the years, their body takes care of the fibrils deposited. With TTR, part of the problem is that when you have high production that we are not able to completely get rid of, the second problem is that most patients develop it at an older age, so their ability to clear it is less. This is another data point that came out a couple of um, uh, months ago, which is the um, um, neuroimmune, now Alexion, fibril depleter phase one trial. Same concept, trying to incite your immune system to remove the fibrils from the myocardium and showed that there is some evidence on imaging and on blood tests that it actually could work. Phase three trial planning is happening and it's gonna start later this year, early next year. So a lot of trials in amyloid. And then finally, uh, uh, um, there is another uh, pan-amyloid depleter. You've already heard from Dr. Wall about his work in this uh, for many, many years. This is not the drug. This is the imaging agent that we have been using, and many of you had underwent this imaging agent before. But the concept is that can you utilize this concept of using an imaging agent and then go after these fibers with an antibody to remove them. And so that, those other two that I showed you are specific to transthyretin. This one is supposed to bind any type of amyloid, so we can leverage it to a lot of other diseases, which is what we're excited about. So how would the future look like? Silencers versus stabilizers? We, we don't know what's going to be the best thing to do. I think we're learning together, and we'll, we'll, you know, you're going to help us at, you know, arrive to these conclusions. Uh, permanent silencing versus ongoing treatment. I think it's going to be you know, decided based on cost effectiveness, safety, and whatnot. Entry fiber depleted therapy will always be probably an add-on because you really want to get rid of the production as well or fix the production problem, not just uh, or stabilize it, not just essentially try to remove it. And then it's really unlikely in the future to see a lot of combination of silencer and stabilizer, especially if we see data coming out from the silencer trials that would argue against that. And this is a, a chance for personalized medicine. You know, people are getting confused. They're like, there are too, way too many treatments. But I would argue that having options is not the same as over choice because it's good to have options. Just remember, seven, eight years ago, there were no options or studied options at least. And so here is where we personalize this. Even if they're equal, we want to personalize it to you. 
And so we already discussed all of this, but the thing that I will end up with is that, you know, there are many centers around the country that are doing uh, these clinical trials. Um, I think it's, it, it's a good thing to be part of the discussion about the treatment paradigm for each patient. If you don't have access or if you have access, talk to your doctors. If you don't have access, talk to others and uh, you know, approach others as well. Thank you.